Do you wish you had a way where you can see what's going on? What are the trends going on in different markets? If you do, then you're in the right place. At Brand Secrets and Strategies, you learn how to save valuable time and money, where you learn strategies to get your products on more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers, empowering brands and raising the bar. Welcome. I talk a lot about community and how that makes natural natural. And one of the things that's great about this community and natural is that we're all working together to help each other succeed. Today's guest is no different. Today's guest has a resource, a valuable resource, that's going to help you gain insights, valuable insights, into what other retailers and other brands are doing around the country. This is something you definitely want to check out because they give you the insights that you need to help you grow and scale your brand. They show you what's working and what's not working in different parts of the country, in different categories, and with different brands. In addition to that, one of the things that they do is that they've got a survey where they talk to a lot of leading retailers. Now, surveys are fantastic because they give you insights about what's going on throughout the industry. Now, what's unique about this survey is that it's very pure in terms of who they talk to. In other words, it's not commoditized information. What I mean by that, a lot of the big brands and a lot of the big solution providers tend to commoditize shoppers, brands, and products, etc., That overlooks what makes natural natural. That overlooks what drives consumers to buy your products over and above your mainstream products. Why your products are more valuable to the retailer in terms of the shoppers that you drive into the store. These insights are invaluable and I've been able to successfully leverage them throughout my entire career. Both when I was working for Kimberly Clark and Unilever and then also for all my individual clients. Some of these resources are that can be a game changer because what a lot of retailers need, they need insights, actionable insights that you can provide to them, not top line canned reports that all of your competition is providing at the same time. Savvy retailers already know how well your brand's performing on the shelf. They want to know about the consumer that you're driving in the store. What's great about these insights, the survey that we're going to be talking about in a minute, is it's going to provide actionable insights to help you help the retailer identify what matters most to them. More customers coming in their store, a reasonable profit in the category, and a competitive advantage in the market. One of the things that I've also done successfully, and I share this a little bit later, is how you can use informal insights that you can get from social listening and from other sources that you can bake into your sales presentation. And this is another way to help you grow and scale your brand. This is another way to help set you apart from other brands that you're competing against. As always, I want to thank you for listening. This show is about you and it's for you. In appreciation for your time, there's a free downloadable guide for you at the end of every episode. I always include one easy to download, quick to digest strategy that you can instantly adopt and make your own. One that you can use to grow sustainable sales with. And don't forget to go back to listen to previous episodes where I may share one of your most pressing bottlenecks. You know, the things that keep you up at night. Remember, this show is about you and it's for you. The goal here is to help you get your product onto more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers. And check out my new YouTube channel where I share illustrations that bring the insights to life on the shorter episodes. Now here's Heather with Whole Foods Magazine. Heather, thank you for coming on today. Could you please start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey to becoming a publisher? Sure. Well, Daniel, thank you for having me as well. Um, My journey, I kind of was born into it, I guess. Um, My father was um, a salesman for a different publication in the um, natural products industry, which was Health Foods Business at the time. And then um, he ended up meeting a man named Larry Hester, who owned um, Whole Foods Magazine at that time. And they got together, and um, my father was um, the workhorse, so to say. And Larry was luckily had um, a good amount of money to fund him. And together, they um, they worked really hard and created um, we recreated Whole Foods Magazine. So um, that was kind of, I always call Whole Foods my sibling growing up because we kind of grew up together. And then um, in 2000, my father did purchase um, completely um, Larry out of the, um, purchased Whole Foods out um, completely. And um, I was working there at the time. And um, yes, when I graduated college, the job market wasn't great. I always knew I'd I had an interest in the industry, obviously, um, the natural products industry, how do you not love (laughs) right away? But also, I mean, publishing always was interest, and I've always liked doing sales. So it was something that I liked, but I wasn't really sure where I was going with things. Um, And when I graduated college, the job market wasn't great. 
went for some interviews, couldn't really afford to take some jobs because um, the pay was not great and um, the commuting would cost me more than what they were paying me. Um, and um, I guess I just knew I had this opportunity and I really liked it. So I decided to take it. And um, I was really blessed because my father had a salesman at the time um, who thought that I could really be good at this. And he said, how he let me train her. And he trained me instead of my dad, which is probably the best thing to do. And um, unfortunately, he got sick and um, had to leave the company. And uh, my dad turned to me and said, you think you could do this with me? And I said, I don't know. Let's try it. And here we were. And then my um, and then I kept on growing and kept on taking more responsibilities away from my father without even trying. It just happened. And so before I knew it, he made me publisher. He um, he got older and decided to send my retire. And he's still the president and um, works two days a week. And um, I do everything else. So, I mean, obviously, I don't write the magazine and do everything else. I have a great staff. <laughs> no, no, that's great. So, But does he still boss you around or can you tell him what to do? Um, I tell him to do more. <laughs> That's good. It's about time, right? You know, come around, come about fair play. Just kidding. So what, what got you interested or what was your, where did you find your interest? What drew you to the natural products industry? Um, well, I guess it was, I mean, I grow up, I went to the trade shows. I mean, they're nothing like they were now. I mean, they were smaller. We say, like, we say we just go trick or treating. Like we just go, I was allergic to chocolate. Carob was big at the time. People just used to give me stuff cause they all knew I was Howie's daughter. That was always a big thing. I was Howie's daughter. Then when you asked him, the question you asked before, now people see him and he's Heather's father. So that's mm. the difference there. Oh, um, nice. But yeah, but I mean, it just, uh, you know, you just saw like the love and the fondness that people had for my father. And then they gave it, it was, they just brought it on to me. And when I did decide to join the company, he brought me to, it was Expo East, my first trade show that I actually worked in. I mean, I was actually getting paid. I, I was free labor for a long time. Um, and um introduced me to a lot of other people that worked for their families and you know they told me what it's like to work for your for work for a family business and you know they all said to me if you want to talk you know anytime we're here and I just tell like you know that they really um respected my father which of course made things easier for me and um, I've been I've been that in the end have returned that favor when people do tell me they're working for a family business I've had returned that favor and said, hey, you know, anything you need. I've been there, done that. What do you need? You know, and it either goes good or bad. There's really no in between there. Well, but I just. Uh, no, keep going. Just, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah, but just the industry. Um, publishing is a lot of fun and it's gotten funner because we can sell even more like by, you know, selling digital, selling, you know, doing podcasts now like we're doing now. So it's even funner than when I started. And, um, you know, the natural industry has gotten way more corporate now, but it's, um. You know, like even you take like Expo not happening this past, you know, this past uh, couple of weeks. We're all sad that we don't get to see each other. I mean, I don't know any other industry that's like that. I got to admit, one of the things that I look for Expo, look forward to, is the networking. Mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of brands going to trade shows because, like to your point, it's not what it used to be. And mm-hmm. certainly nothing against them. But my point is it's hard to sell. And so for me, it's a big networking event. It's an opportunity to reconnect and establish those bonds, et cetera. So when you're talking about that relationship that you have with the industry, I really want to get into the the family business part. And, And why I wanted to talk about this is because one of the things I think that makes natural natural is that even though we're not blood family, we are a family. And because we work together and we help support each other. So I love the way you put that. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And then how does that influence you? And then how do you think that that influences a lot of the brands that you see on shelves and retailers? Gosh, that's like a three-point question. Um, First of all, I I want to just say something about what you just said before about networking. You're absolutely right there. And it's actually funny because I actually used a line the other day because it's been it's been hard to do sales lately i mean it's it's hard calling people you don't know what state they're in it's hard you know sending emails you just don't know how people are feeling you know with anything or if they're how they're affected by what's going on right now and i being a small company how we grow is by networking hence you're one of our partners that we enjoy working with and um likewise and i just said someone i said the other day i said I might not be able to sell something, but I'm really good at networking Um, because that's all I've been doing lately. But it's been fun because at least I get to talk to my friends. But um, back to your original question. Um, So uh, the influence is, um, gosh, um, it's a little bit of a hard question, actually. (laughs) Um, um, Well, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, going to, I work a lot with the supplement people. 
Um, but I mean, a large part of our industry now is the grocery people. And I'm, I'm beginning to get to know a lot more of them. And I mean, there's so many new people coming in. And, you know, I mean, if you take like you or I, we walk through Expo, we used to know everybody. Now there's like a whole hand, like there's thousands of people that we have no idea who they are and they don't know who we are, but hopefully they will soon. <laughs> um, and I mean, so it's, we are very influential on things. Um, and um, I mean, the industry as a whole, um, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts on this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Go ahead. You're doing great. Um, the industry as a whole, we just, um, you know, with the with the, with so many people, um, you know, merging, and especially on the dietary supplement side of it, um, you know, with all the mergers and acquisitions that's going on, it's actually grown to be a smaller, such a more corporate area. But yet, I mean, you still see some of the same people there, which makes it nice. But it does make it a lot more harder to be doing business and. Um, you know, and I think the little stores do find that as well because, you know, they don't get the deals as much and definitely from the distributors, it's a real hard thing because, um, you know, it's hard for a new company to get into the distribution. It's hard, you know, I mean, it's hard, um, even to get noticed and then, you know, and, and it's, it's pay to play, you need money. And I mean, that's why a lot of it has been investments. Um, you see a lot of our brands on Shark Tank, you see, um, people just, um, you know, doing everything they can. And that's where I think actually, and I know I'm going off topic a little bit, I'm sorry. No, um, that's fine. But, um, you know, I, I, I kind of went, spent a lot of time on LinkedIn after Expo West got canceled or postponed and then canceled. And, um, you know, you saw these little guys really putting their stuff out there and just trying to get, and, um, you know, but also on the other hand, even though they're going to get money back and they're, you know, they're in this, um, you know, they're, they're getting some money back and all that. Um, you know, it's all the money they put out by setting up a booth and all that stuff. And you see people like these influencers that will actually pick them up and will actually, but I mean, it might actually, some people actually think it might be better for them that they didn't have this because they didn't have all the expenditure. I don't really know exactly what's going to happen, but I've had so many conversations with so many people about brands that I, I probably wouldn't have even seen at Expo because it's just too big that you began to notice. And we actually helped out quite a bit. We, um, we kind of did where we did a virtual tour of Expo where people, you know, we invited anybody to send us your press releases, send us your photos, send us any specials you had going on. And if anyone, a lot of people did like pop-ups and stuff like that at show, and, you know, said, tell us what's going on. Let us know. So we tried to help everyone. And I mean, not only us, um, obviously New Hope was, uh, trying to do everything they can do there. BevNet, I know was very instrumental in doing things as well. So, I mean, you know, I can't take all the credit, but, um, I know we did our part. Um, and you know, you got to give, you got to give credit to everybody. Um, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, no, that's exactly what I, what I think of, you know, when I think of net family, I think of the trust that you have. First of all, there's a trust factor within this industry and mm -hmm. outsiders coming into this industry are kind of, you know, it takes a while to kind of build that trust and mm -hmm. develop that relationship. But to your point, those of us that are in this industry, we have a connection, which is really great. I think it's great that you're doing their virtual tours and expo. And back to your point, that's one of the biggest challenges that I have with a trade show of this magnitude. Again, it's a lot of fun. But the mm -hmm. issue is that if you're a small brand or if you're a retailer, it's hard to have that one-on-one -on -one time with any brand, with any retailer. And it's really, really hard when you're, you know, you don't walk around the trade flow, trade show floor with a hat on saying, hey, I'm a buyer at a retailer or something like that. So mm -hmm. they don't know who you are. And so that, I think, gets lost, that experience, that, that you know, what we used to have before. We used to get to sit down and, and talk to someone one-on-one. -on -one. So I think to that degree, it's good in the sense that now people are trying to become more creative. And mm -hmm. one of the things I really like about this is that as an industry, we're trying to find ways to help these brands get discovered and get in front of retailers without the traditional pay-to-play model being such an influence. That's why you and I are talking today, and we're mm -hmm. going to be doing a webinar next week. I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to raise the bar in the industry. And so back to the networking thing, if I may, one of the things that's really great 
is because I've built these courses and the podcast and the YouTube mm-hmm. channel, etc. It provides the people for co- to come on and talk about what they've learned. So you talked about Shark Tank. Dustin Finkel was on the podcast and laid out everything that he did to get on Shark mm-hmm. Tank. So it's a great episode. The point being is that with what you provide, the articles that you provide, the tremendous insights that you provide, etc., and what a lot of us are doing in the industry, New Hope, BevNet, etc., mm-hmm. we're, tr- we're making it possible for these brands brands and these retailers to thrive in the absence of Expo West. Your thoughts? Um, No, absolutely. And um, that's where we've always have been because basically, um, you know, I mean, you have, you used to have 30 seconds to talk to everybody at the show. Now you don't even have that. I think maybe it's five seconds. Um, So you really can't make an impression. And that's why a magazine like ourselves is good. I mean, there is a lot of education that goes on at Expo, but yes, you have to have a super pass for a lot of it, and some of the rooms are just so crowded. So, and then once the show's over, it's done. I mean, you know, there is other things, and that's where you know we have we inform and educate every month, um, every day on our website. And I mean, others do that too. I don't mean to say that we're the only ones doing it, but um, if you look through and you just read our magazine, I mean, you you'll be very well educated by the time you're done with any issue. Especially, I mean, one of the sad things that my not having the expo is that our March show issue was our um, retailer survey, which basically gave a whole report on the industry, dollars and cents that were spent and the levels of the stores and all that. So, I mean, this is pertinent information, of course, and it's on our website, which is wholefoodsmagazine.com. Um, and it's, um, we actually will be doing a webinar on that as well on April 29th, just to talk people through that as well. So, um, I mean, you know, we're here to educate and do things, but, um, I'm really interested, I mean, going a whole year ahead now with, like, um, everything that's gone on now. And, I mean, we were actually, because we obviously this came out in, in March, but it was for 2019. So in the beginning of this year, we already saw that, we thought that we were going to see a big difference in the numbers for next year, meaning this year, 2020, because of um, the Earth Fair going out of business, because of Lucky's. You know, that that was a big loss for a lot of people. So we, um, we already were, we already were like, well, let's see what happens with our new numbers. But now, I mean, then you throw this whole pandemic into it and stores are doing great. Um, so I'm not really sure. Yeah. So the numbers will be, will be interesting in 2020, but obviously we have to get through this year first and get through what we're going through right now. But, um, but yeah, uh, education is such a big part of a retailer staying alive and being competitive in this industry of, um, you know, of mass market and other competitors out there. And if they don't educate themselves, learn how to merchandise and do the things that we teach them how to do as well as others, um, they're not going to survive. No. And that's exactly why I hung my shingle. That's why I do what I do to fill that void that unfortunately is, is in the industry. We're not, and and what I mean by that is, is mainstream CPG, we had to become very strategic because of Walmart, because of all the consolidations, et cetera. Those same skills, actually, that's how category management was born, to weed mm-hmm. out some of the inefficiencies and the costs, et cetera. And so we had to become a lot more strategic. And those strategies that we learn can be applied to natural without losing your natural flair or for, without selling your soul, if, as a lot of people mm-hmm. would put it. So that's what's so critically important. But now you're talking about the magazine. I want to get talk about the retailer mm-hmm. survey, too. We sure. probably should have asked you, I probably should have started by asking you, Tell us a little bit about the magazine. What is the purpose? What is the mission? What are you trying to do? And who are who's your primary audience? Because your your space, your your niche is unique compared to other um, mm-hmm. publications out there. Sure. And you play such an important role in this industry. Well, we are um, we're B two B, so we are business to business for the natural product retailer. Um, unfortunately, that number hasn't been growing, but other people selling natural products, as the CPG people are. Um, has been growing. So um, we reach um, anyone that sells a natural product. So it, can, it mostly is comprised of natural product retailers, but um, it also is um, comprised of supermarkets that sell natural products, drugstores that sell natural products, um, your your um, mass merchandisers, um, you know, your Costco's and all that. Of course, they sell a lot of products as well. Um, plus, um, we've been are we been um, having a lot of natural practitioners join our list recently. More digital than um, than in print, but um, but yeah, so people like that um, definitely is. So anyone that basically sells a natural product is someone that would be on our list. But we do say we are primarily a publication for the natural product retailer. 
Gotcha. Um, mm-hmm. But we are, as you've heard me say many times on this already, and I say all the time, we inform and educate. And that's basically what our what our uh, mission is, is to form and educate in the natural products industry. So whether you are a manufacturer, a supplier, a retailer, um, or someone else that sells a natural product, we hope that we do have, have a space for you there. We The magazine is very categorically um, laid out, as is our website, where um, you can, if you're a grocery buyer, you can go in and get your grocery information. And if you don't want to read the rest, you're missing out, but you got your information you needed. Dietary supplement, you will find a little bit more because it's more to write about and um, you will have stuff there. Suppliers, we always have something for the supply side of the industry as well. And it's, again, our website is the same way. It's totally broken out that way. We do have um, content that does um, help everybody. And, um, you know, it's very easy to find what what helps you there. Um, And that's kind of, um, you know, kind of what we try to do is just try to be a useful resource for anybody in the industry to make your job better and hopefully easier. Well, and thank you for sharing that because it's about raising the bar in the industry. It's about giving back to what we started with, that networking, that family, being able to provide insights to people. Heather, I spent a lot of time talking about how brands can't possibly know everything that's going on in the industry through every state, and neither can retailers, et cetera. In fact, retailers cannot possibly be an expert in every item on their or shelves or every category. So it's incumbent on us to help those brands and those retailers connect and share those insights to give them a competitive advantage against their mainstream counterparts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Craven coined the frame mass the frame coined the frame mass slippage, which uh-huh. I love. And they, even though I wasn't using that term, that's kind of where I was going with this uh, mm-hmm. before. But the point is, how do we help these natural retailers remain relevant and thrive? And one of the things that I think we do is by teaching them strategies that they're not going to learn with the traditional models that I believe are somewhat broken in Mm -hmm. mainstream retail. And that's about, like you said, merchandising and choosing which products and what's going on in the category and so on and so forth. When you talk about education, again, such a critically important part of, of what we all do, how are you unique? How do you see you being unique in the industry in terms of the education that you provide? Well, we do rely upon, it's true. I mean, retailers know a lot. They really are very smart, um, but obviously they do need to learn more. And, um, you know, I mean, they learn from from companies. They learn a lot about the products themselves, and we help that as well. We speak to a lot of experts in the industry that do tell us about the products. You know, when we do have, um, we talk about something different each month, obviously. Um, and with that, we, you know, we, as I said, experts do tell us about what is their new products and what offerings they have. And then we also do get things on how to merchandise them. We do work closely with um, Jay Jacobowitz, who, who does our retail insights, um, who is from retail insights and does our merchandising insights column, um, who helps them with, um, with um, merchandising. Plus, we also have a tip of the month every month, which Jay does six months of the year and you do six months of the year. So, nice. um so yeah so I mean we always are trying to give them ways to do more and how to do things more um but also they need to know about the product education and what the offerings are now more than ever because by missing expo you know that's where everybody has new products right I don't know if I ever shared with you that I used to be a retailer I used to be a retailer at Price Club I was the grocery manager Uh now it's a little bit different but very similar back then because Uh we had that small feel uh, approach and, and what I was getting about, you know, I can't be an expert about in everything. I remember I used to open the store up at 4 or 5 in the morning. and But then, you know, I got to go home about 9, 30, 10 at night. But don't worry, I only did that six days a week. <laughs> and so the point being is that's a lot of work. And uh-huh. it's incumbent upon those of us that have that that ability to help provide those insights to retailers, et cetera. So your retail survey, talk a little bit about that. What If I'm a retailer... Why do I care? Why does that matter? How's it going to help me grow and thrive? Because I've looked at it. It's great. Well, because um, basically you're going to learn, um, you know, we do break it up. We, we do we measure it by perishables, how much, perish, how much perishables you sell in your store. So we have a level, level one, level two, level, you know, and that's how, you know, we kind of have the, the levels of the store. It's a big, the, obviously a huge amount of perishables makes you the big supermarkets. Um, the small or none makes you like a vitamin shop type. And it's um, then we do your sales via that, um, how much traffic there is. Um, basically, um, you know, we, um, 
how to how to advertise, you know, how they, how much money they're spending in advertising, what they're doing to promote themselves, um, and things like that. Um, you know, we ask them questions. You know, a lot of social media obviously has fallen a lot more into things that way. But how do people better what they are doing? Um, and that's kind of where this that's a kind of a generalization of the survey. It goes way more deeper than that, but it does talk about your sales as to. I mean, the the dollars were up. I'm sorry, I don't have them. I have the number on top of my head, but it was it was a good number. <laughs> um, and um, they weren't up a lot, but they were up. Um, and basically, um, it just talks about how, um, you know, how these different levels of stores, how they can compete and how they do well with what they're doing. And I'm not really explaining as well as I'd like to for some reason. No, I think um, you're doing great. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But basically, it's, you know, like this, like the... Um, the small to mid-sized store has been the most trouble spot. And that was like an earth fair type of store. So that shows something right there. They've had the most problems of anyone. Um, but, um, you know, your vitamin shops actually do well because, you know, their markups are higher and they just have, um, they just sell vitamins. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, so we measure it as to, as I said, how many perishables are being sold in the stores and the levels of um, what they are that way. Um, and then, you know, it's just what they do um how how much their rent is, how much you know, what their costs are, how much um, inventory they carry, you know, things like that. And this way, um, you know, why retailers are concerned about it is to see how they compare with others that are like them. Well, thank you for sharing all that. One of the things that I think is really great about your survey, all surveys, especially yours, is that again, as a retailer, I don't have the ability to to call up every retailer in every different community and find out what they're doing. And so it helps bring us together and it gives me insights into what's working and what's not working. And it helps me succeed. More importantly, it allows me, like you were kind of talking about a minute ago, it allows me to self-segment myself around the kind of retailer that I am. I am. So for example, when I work for Spins, we were talking about pill shops and small retailers and vitamin mm -hmm. cotton, you know, like a GNC and a vitamin shop, et cetera, versus a natural grocers and so on. The point being is that all those stores are a little bit different. NFM has a really good survey too that really puts people in different buckets. But what I love about your survey is it's, I would say it's more pure than a lot of the other servers in terms of where the information comes from. By the way, one of the things I love about surveys is that a lot of times that information is even better than what you'd get if you had an opportunity to have every every retailer open up the books. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is that those numbers aren't always clean. Let me let me kind of a little off topic, but this kind of help illustrate it. When I got out of college, I used to be an analyst for Standard & Poor's. And I used to analyze companies primarily in the gas and oil business and chemicals and stuff like that. And companies, they they... They say this is what our net income is based on, don't get too into the weeds, but they would define themselves differently. And so I would have to standardize them and say, this is what you are based upon how you sell, et cetera. And again, a little bit into the weeds, but what I'm getting at is when you're talking about a retailer that has a similar size footprint and a similar size supplement category and a similar size produce section, then those are apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Where unfortunately, a lot of the publications that are out there, you're a store and it doesn't differentiate. And you really can't get those nuances from what's working, what's not working, unless you segment, unless you get down to that level. Your thoughts? Um, first of all, I'm thinking you've had many different jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been around. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had one job basically my whole life as I'm, well, my adult life. <laughs> um, but um, but yes, that's I I agree with everything that you just said, um, and it is um, first of all I just want to get to um, yeah what makes our survey different is because it is just for the natural products industry we don't really put the whole rest of the industry in there and then we also do have the retail universe which does talk about the mass market and your superstores and all that it gets your Trader Joe's in there as well as your Whole Foods markets and your other stores that do sell naturals but um, our our Yes, our survey is just pure natural product retailers, and that's the difference there, and that is what makes it pure, or so to say, what you said. No, thanks for but, sharing that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, I, but, what the reasons I brought that out? Oh, sorry, I didn't, go ahead, please. No, you go. Um, okay, but yeah, so um, but yes, with everything that you were just saying, that it is. Um, I mean, every category manager needs needs what they need to to do their job well. Everybody wants to succeed. Otherwise, you know, we know what doesn't happen if you don't succeed. 
And, um, you know, just saying everybody needs the information. And, yeah, you can't. I mean, it's a sampling. Like any survey, it is a sampling. Um, but, you know, it's if you see that you compare or you see that, you know, maybe you should be doing something different that you learned from somebody else, that's what a survey is good and useful for. I mean, we also do. We have a page in the magazine each month called What's Selling, which is it's not a scientific survey at all. It's just retailers telling us. It's our most popular page, actually. It's retailers just telling us what's selling in their store in different categories. Um, and we actually have, we do a natural choice awards as well, and it does mirror it pretty closely. So we do know that it does kind of mean something there that people do know what's selling in their stores. It's a lot easier now than it, I mean, way back when my dad first started working, I think they used to just call up a retailer and maybe they just gave their favorite products or looked on the shelves and see what was there. Um, I mean, now they have inventory, you know, systems and things like that where they could actually give us true numbers. And it's so important. And what I was getting at a minute ago, and you're absolutely right, so thanks for framing that, is that a lot of people commoditize retailers, stores, shoppers, products, etc. And what makes us unique, what makes natural natural, that pure play that we're talking about here, is we're talking about what's really natural. And let me give you an example. A lot of times people talk about the low cost consumer. Well, if I use that term in mainstream, they think of the person that eats a couple salads and goes for a walk. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not us. You know, we're paying attention to our to our carbon footprint and, and mm -hmm. a lot of different things that go way, way beyond what a lot of people think about. You know, where did the product come from? Was it regenerative agriculture that it, where it was grown? Sure. All of that. And the point being is that those kind of insights are so much more relevant because that's the world we play in. That's the ripple in the pond. And, and what I'm getting at there is that the ripple in the pond, what we're talking about, where these trends begin, this later becomes the tidal wave that ends up on a Kroger shelf and the tsunami that ends up on a Walmart shelf. But this is the industry. This is where this starts. And so by having a retailer share that in, those insights really helps out a lot. So in my world, one of the things I've done several times is I've actually had a brand do a very informal, unscientific survey on Facebook, et cetera, and I've baked those insights into their selling story. And okay. those insights those, those selling that within their selling story, their deck, has helped them get our store shelves. And the reason for that is because they're providing insights to retailers that no one else provides. So it's extremely val valuable. And more importantly, in the retailer community, again, I mean, we we're talking about what I used to do in terms of hours. You don't have time to spend, you know, going to different stores, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So being able to have a resource like Whole Foods Magazine that's going to help me see around the corner and help me see what's going on in different markets it's, it's critically important, and it's an indispensable resource to the retail community. One of the things you talked about is mid-size, small to mid-size stores are struggling. How would you define those stores, and then why do you think that is? Oh, my gosh. Um, well, I think, as I said, because, you know, you go to the big grocery store, you're doing your big, your big shop. You know, you're, you're doing your buying your groceries, you're doing all that, and you can get your supplements there, too. Um, and then, you know, you have... You're, if you just go in and buy a dietary supplement, you might just go just to your vitamin shop and just buy that. Um, so the ones, you know, I mean, because if you're going to the small to mid-sized stores, they aren't going to have all the groceries you want. So you can't do your grocery shopping there. And, you know, maybe they might have all your supplements. But, I mean, it's just that you can't, it's not the big shop that you're looking to do or the quick shop that you're looking to do. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of in between. And it's uh, obviously the rent is higher. Um you know, having more perishables is more expensive because, you know, you have to have the turnaround for it. Um, and um, basically, you know, you have your inventory. I mean, everything in a bigger store, you have to have more of everything. And, you know, your costs are higher. You know, you also, it depends upon where you are. And, you know, traffic, store traffic is a huge thing, too, no matter where. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, our local, by our office, our local health food store, um, they... They move. I mean, now they've been there for years, but I remember they first went to go move in there, and um, it was they were they were building the Walmart there, and um, everyone questioned, they're like, why would you go in a Walmart shopping center? And they've they've thrived. I mean, they've gotten bigger, they've thrived, and you know, so it is something. I mean, I'm sure they. I hate to say it, but I'm sure they lost some customers that maybe somebody um, has, you know, asked them about a, a probiotic or something like that, and then they go to Walmart and buy it cheaper. I'm sure that happens sometimes, but I mean, they have a loyal following. I went in there, I went in there right before I thought I was going to Expo West, um, just to like, 
get all my immune products, get my hand sanitizer, get everything um, before. And it was, I mean, it was bustling. It was, it was so busy. It was, you know, lunchtime, they have a juice bar. It was nice. Um, but I want to say something when you talked about trends. Um, when you were talking about, um, you know, how we start the trends, it's so, it's so true right now. Like, look, how big is plant-based right now? And where did that start? Yeah, that? small stores, small brands. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, and we've been, we've been eating plant-based for years. No one ever knew it. Um, yeah. We've been doing plant protein. You know, how long has pea protein been part of what, you know, what we've been doing yeah. um, or rice protein or any kind of, you know, but, um, but it's, I mean, that's probably the biggest example right now of how a trends um, that's nationwide that's in every, you know, that's every marketer is doing now started with just the natural products industry. Um, so, I mean, yes, we are trendsetters now and we really, to set the trends as to what's selling in the natural product stores. I mean, you're always going to have your consumer that's going to eat their Doritos and I don't know what else, what else is bad for you um, <laughs> and drink their, and drink their, drink their um, soda. Um, but I mean, for that, you, you have somebody that has converted and the millennials do. I mean, the millennials would rather have their kombucha than their Pepsi. Well, and it's so important that, that you know, we're talking about this. I'm so glad you, t- you brought this up. Small retailers, that's one of the main reasons why I do what I do. I have a belief that retail is broken. And the reason I say that is because most retailers, they are told this is the way we need to do this. There's a, you know, the the strategies that your grandfather used, your great grandfather used, are not going to work today. And what I'm getting at is this is why I think that there's such an opportunity for us. And so having a store, you you always hear that price is the only thing that drives sales Mm -hmm. at shelf. Well, in mainstream, that's kind of true. And the reason that is that way is because I believe that the big retailers are spending most of their time trying to sell us the stuff that they have on their shelf rather than ask us what we want to buy. So price is the only way that they can drive those sales off shelf. However, Mm -hmm. the small niche niche stores have a unique opportunity to differentiate themselves. And this is why I'm so glad you mentioned that. So what I want smaller retailers to do is develop a strategy where you've got the things in your store, a few of the things in your store, where you you leave that perception with the consumer that you've got good prices, you've got Mm -hmm. a decent selection, doesn't mean you have everything, but then you sell those unique items that you can't get anywhere else. So for example, using the 80-20 rule, if I go into a small retail like the one you're talking about, mm-hmm. and I can get kettle chips for the same price that I can get at the Walmart, sure. mm-hmm. okay, that makes sense. But next to the kettle chips, I might put a dip that you can't find anywhere in town but at my store. And it's an amazing dip, and I can make up the margin <laughs> on that dip. And then you think about the market basket, someone who buys the kettle chips and the dip or whatever products, that sure. customer is going to spend a lot more money. And it's about... How do you position that retailer as being a value add? You develop a lot of people talk about loyalty as being a card. The mm-hmm. reality is that mm-hmm. loyalty cards are really nothing more than a coupon. I've got a loyalty mm-hmm. card for every airline I fly on, for every store I shop at. Me Think too. about it. We most of us do, right? <laughs> uh-huh. So loyalty is earned, it's not bought. And so if a retailer, a smaller retailer, can give their customers what they want exceed their expectations by having the products, et cetera, that are unique and different, they can develop a loyal following in their store. And that's going to differentiate them from the big retailers. If you think about, you know, a a big ship can't turn on the ocean very quickly. That's what the big retailers are like. Mm -hmm. So Uh now we've got this pandemic and the big retailers are struggling to keep up with the products that they have. Mm -hmm. Well, these smaller stores, if they're really smart, they might be thinking creatively about, well, what things boost immune support that we could provide to the community that are unique and different, et cetera, old-fashioned remedies, ancient, whatever, Mm -hmm. that the big stores can't get. And we could own that part of the conversation. And so that's what I love about what you're talking about. Back to your survey, this is why this matters. When a independent retailer is talking about what's selling in their store, Mm-hmm. They're not talking about, well, look, this retail, this brand here just paid me a ton of money to put this product on the shelf. Yes. They're talking about stuff that has a relationship with their customers. And so their customers come in and say, God, this stuff's great. And it's that relationship 
that story that helps build that loyalty. And that's where I think we can really help these smaller retailers compete more effectively, survive, and thrive. I think a lot of retailers are going to go by the wayside next year, the bigger retailers. And, and unfortunately, some of them need to. But I think it's critically important that smaller and independent retailers, co-ops, etc., leverage some of the strategies that we're talking about so that they remain relevant. Relevant meaning that customers think of them as a destination for certain types of products. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and that's exactly where, uh, what makes, and that's exactly what we do is make sure they get educated, make sure they know a product that maybe is not selling in the mainstream. That is something that can be there that yes, they have to have their big brands. They have to have some of those things. Cause, and, and there is people that loyally go into that store and buy those big brands from them. But just say like right now, um, everybody's looking for immune products. They go in looking for that elderberry. Maybe they're all sold out of elderberry. Um, that seems to be what the what I've been hearing, um, but in the meantime, you know maybe they say, well maybe you want to buy take some garlic or take some oil of oregano or something else that you know the mainstream people don't know about. But then they're like, okay, yes, I do have some um, immune products here, or even what we have been saying is, um, I've been having this conversation with quite a few other people is that if you're immune end cap, obviously you had an end cap for immune because you know you knew what, you know you're not stupid, you're going to do sell what's what needs to be sold. Um, but if those products are sold out, then, you know, do something else. Maybe um, people are quarantined. Maybe you do a thing of chips. May or maybe, as I had the conversation with someone, I think I mentioned to you the other day, you know, maybe you do some self-care stuff. You do, people can't get haircuts anymore. They can't color their hair. They can't get their nails done. They can't, um, I don't know, all the things that us women do. Um, they can't get a facial. You know, maybe you have, like, you know, some masks out there in front to be like, let's do some self-care. I mean, you still, you feel well. You want to you look good. You know, you want to feel good still. Um, or, you know, just, you know, color those roots or whatever, whatever, you know, you need to be do doing at the time. There's plenty of natural products for that. And, you know, maybe somebody then is sweet. I mean, there might be some people that don't go back to their salon. I don't know. Um, then there might be some people that don't go back to their big store when they find that, um, you know, they could buy a seventh generation, um, toilet paper in a natural product store. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's things people, you know, they, people are experimenting and finding and I actually had that conversation back to plant-based, sorry to reiterate things, but I actually had that conversation with someone, a plant-based person today that, um, you know, they were laughing that everything that was left in the, in the freezer case was just the plant-based stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so someone actually tries it and maybe they actually do stick with it. You know, it's a great opportunity for, and it is, I mean, you don't want something like this to be an opportunity, but it is a chance that maybe people try something that they can't have before. And that's where people are, so there probably are people that are going to a health food store for the first time in their lives right well, that's, now. That's a good thing. That's that exciting to hear. <laughs> yeah, because I don't, so, want, I don't want to make, like, take a, a pandemic and make it, like, you know, a good thing for us, but we have to find the silver lining anywhere. And obviously, yeah. the quote after Expo was, we're making lemonade, and we've been making lots of lemonade these past couple of um, uh, Absolutely. weeks. Absolutely. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, that retailer really has an opportunity now, but always to sell something that really is something different. Yes, you have the people that draw them in, um, but, you know, any good retailer that says, and most of them are, Say, hey, what are you looking for? And before you know it, they're not just buying an elderberry. Yeah, they're buying actually, oil right now, or they're buying, um, you know, even vitamin C. Gosh, I mean, you know, there's studies, so many studies right now that vitamin C has been so good for people. I mean, you know, and, you know, someone might have forgotten about their vitamin C because, you know, they're hopped up on the elderberry right now. I don't know. <laughs> I wrote an article many, many years ago about the Dr. Oz effect back before he cracked mm -hmm. down. But, you know, when he was, he was such a champion of healthy products. And, and the point being is that talking about what these products are, what's unique about them. Uh, I used to work for a supplement brand that, uh, that had a whole food supplement. I think the best brand out there. They're amazing. But the point is that there's a big difference between that and other products on the shelf. And here's where mm -hmm. I'm going with this. When you think about natural, for example, versus mainstream, if I go to a mainstream store and I can buy, 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 buy vitamin C, two, four, five dollars or something like that for a thousand milligrams, or I can buy one bottle for thirty dollars for fifty milligrams, but yet this thirty dollar bottle is going to metabolize my body. It's going to do more for me than these two bottles over here. I'm just going to pee it out. And the point being is that if you are what you if if you mm -hmm. are what you eat and you eat 
saying this wrong. <laughs> if you if you if you believe that you are what you eat and what you eat matters, then understanding that difference and the point being mm-hmm. that, like you were talking about, is that there's a big difference between the quality of the products and the oh, ingredients yeah. within the products that you get at a natural store. They're more pure. They're more clean. They're mm-hmm. it's more clean. Is that's that's not the right way to put it? But but you know what I mean. Another they're cleaner. They're they're products that you can trust. When well, an age of transparency trust. now, I mean, yes. you see everything. I mean, you know, there's no secrets in anything. I mean, we, we all test, we all do everything. I mean, you know, it's, you know, I mean, the products are, you know, as clean as you're going to, as you're going to get and clean label is such a big part. We, we actually have something coming out very soon on clean label as well. Um, but it's um, actually in April, it's out, it'll be out in everyone's mailboxes soon. Good, <laughs> good, good. Uh-huh. I think it. it's on our website. It's on our website now, actually. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, it, there's no there's no hiding anything anymore in this industry. I mean, we are a regulated industry, even though we're not regulated. <laughs> well, it, but we reg we, we self regulate. Yeah, we go be. And uh-huh. I'm glad you said that because I know of a company that says that they are transparent, uh-huh. and all they did is they stopped feeding their livestock um, antibi- um steroids. Oh gosh. They're uh-huh. still raised inhumanely. They're still, you know, oh, in a gosh. pen with a lot of it. I, a lot of the things that wouldn't do that we wouldn't do. But okay, so the brand mm-hmm. I was talking about, go ahead and share it was Mega Food. They I, I knew inv- you were going to say that too. Yeah, they're, oh, I love them. They're fantastic. <laughs> well, plus, you, well, you quoted Robert earlier. So. Yeah, I did. Well, I mean, that's one of my favorite <laughs> brands. But one of the things that they do is they've got the Big Tree Tea Transparency Project. Uh-huh. You can go yeah. on their website and you can actually see how the product's made all the way through the line. They actually share their ingredients. <laughs> Most natural products literally put the recipe on their product. And because mm-hmm. that's the level of transparency where if you buy a lot of those other products, you don't really have that. You know, transparency for them is, well, we didn't use as much dye in the the packaging, whatever. One of the things that I'm doing, spending a lot of time is is focused on compostable packaging, uh, backyard compostable packaging, etc. And I'm learning so much. So that's one of the areas I cover, kind of off topic a little bit. The other thing you mentioned that I think is so critically important about this industry, not critically important. One of the the, the biggest pluses or benefits of this industry and you mentioned i'm so glad you did if i walk into a mainstream store and i say where's the vitamin c uh, it's back that way someplace go find it yourself Uh right if i walk into a small store and that's where i was going with that dr oz effect uh, uh article is that yeah if you're out of a product don't complain that you're out of it help that customer understand what else is out there Mm-hmm. To your point, you know, if you want something to deal with um, cold and flu, et cetera, you know, what about oil of oregano or what about some of the other products people might take that you may not have thought about that might work every bit as well as some of the other things. Mm-hmm. And so the point being is that natural where that ripple starts, this is where we begin to educate coming full circle with a, you know, with our conversation. This is where we educate our consumers, our community about the value of the products that we sell. That's why you can sell a bottle of vitamin C for $30 and sales are going up, uh, uh, going mm-hmm. up steadily. Whereas, you know, two for $5, I cannot pay you as a customer enough money or discount the stuff enough to take it off my shelf is kind of the, the mindset. Sure. So mm-hmm. that's what's unique about this industry. And again, if we can help those smaller independent retailers, understand best practices but yet within this industry what's different about it how you should merchandise your categories etc there are a lot of opportunities for us to make an even bigger impact and that's one of the things i'm looking forward to in the webinar we're talking about the courses etc mm-hmm. so of course we'll be looking for that but the content that you put on your website is definitely helping retailers make that shift and helping the brands help the retailers compete more effectively and make that all important shift. So sure. thank you, know you for doing that. Is? I'm sorry, I mean, no, you. no, I'm finished. Um, is, um, you know, again, by getting back to transparency and all that is that, you know, so many raw material suppliers now, um, do, do advertise or do tell their story. And that's actually part of what we do as well. And I should have gotten that when we were speaking of our, every one of our features discusses raw materials to the finished product. Because they're all branded, they have, I mean, the transparency is right there, and they're all branded as to um, what they do. And by them, by the by the manufacturer then, putting it on their label or just showing what they are, 
that lesson that they have that they've already sold to other people now goes through to this manufactured product as well. I mean, you take a company like Mega Food. I mean, they're doing everything. I've actually seen them. I've been to Mega Food. I've seen what they do. I mean, it's an amazing facility. And I mean, they have all the food there that they're, you know, I saw the vitamin C being made from the oranges there. Um, but then on other hands, like um, you take a raw material supplier like Sapinsa, um, which is in a lot of, a lot of um, finished products on our shelves now. I actually did have the opportunity to be in India and see where their, um, their turmeric was grown and what happened and how it became curcumin and all that. And it's, um, you know, amazing thing. Or someone like Gaia that has, that started from the beginning on their, on their labels. Um, I mean, so there's plenty of people that do it, but then, um, the raw material, like, as I said, like a Sabinsa and so many others and Dina, so many others do actually have that whole trail of where their fields are and where everything has happened. And, um, it really then makes that retailer know wholeheartedly when they're selling a product that they're selling a quality product and they're not selling something that's made with filler or doesn't make the RDAs or, you know, or as you say, with the vitamin C that you could pee out on, right. you know, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it is a difference and that's where the retailer does have that leg up on the, cons- on those um, Walmarts or whatever um, because their products and they could actually they could talk about it intelligently because they've read about it or they've learned about it. A rep has even told them about it, but hopefully they read about it in Whole Foods magazine. Um, of course. And, you know, and that's how, you know, that's how really they get to keep their customers and maybe and they will even pay more for certain things because of that. Exactly. Well, the, the, the law of reciprocation, if you walk into a store and someone's going to spend time with you and, and help, uh, help you understand that, well, this ingredient, this particular pill is put together with high heat and pressure. That way the, now it's not going to have the same nutrients that this mm-hmm. other product was put together. There's so many different things within our industry. So many things people don't think about, but that education, I had a great conversation with Phil Lemper, the supermarket guru, and we were talking mm-hmm. about this and what we were talking about, the all important role that natural retailers play is the theater. And what I mean by that is helping customers understand why this is different than this. I remember going into a retailer once years ago as a kid, and I had my kids with me. Actually, I was younger, mm-hmm. but I mean, I had my kids with me. And um, anyhow, the, the guy in the produce department actually cut into a couple apples and said, here, try this one. And I had never tried some of those different varieties of apples. But it's, you know, that experience at theater. that, yeah. uh-huh. And that's, you know, like I tell people, I never go into Whole Foods because I want to buy groceries. I go into Whole Foods because of the community, because of the theater, because of the atmosphere, Mm -hmm. because of the vibe. I can get cheaper stuff other places anytime. And, and that's, and with any, you know, a lot of different retailers. I mean, if you shop the whatever, but then again, if you compare the quality, well, if you are what you eat and what you eat matters, this is one of the biggest challenges that I think one of the biggest failings I think we have as an industry, we're told to focus on price. And so the analogy that I give is that if I eat the cheap generic bread, I'm hungry before I finish eating it. If I eat the best mainstream bread, I might be satiated mm-hmm. for a couple hours. If you are what you eat and what you eat matters, and I eat the best organic bread, I might be satiated longer. So mm-hmm. if I spend an extra 40, 50 cents at shelf, but yet I eat less bread over time because it satiates my body, then mm-hmm. I'm actually cheaper. And I wish that this industry would really work on adopting that. But my point is, that natural retailer is such a critical component of this industry, such a uh, critical uh, part of this industry, because they're the ones that communicate those unique values, those important attributes to the customer, and they bring new customers into this this world. And again, like the ripple in the pond, this is where all these play, all these things take place. I would have been, I would have, could have told you back you many, many years ago that gluten-free was going to be a big deal. And everyone mm-hmm. said, no, 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 no. But yet, look where it is today, or chia, or you name it. So, uh-huh. You're absolutely again, right. Those are the trends thing. that started in our industry that now became yeah. big and mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. it's, it's, but thank you for doing what you do. What have we not covered that you'd like to share? I think we covered a lot. Um, yeah. God, I mean, you know, we both, you know, have spent a long time in this industry. I think we could talk forever. Um, but I think um, let's leave them something for the webinar um, okay. for next week to learn more. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just, um, you know, we're a special industry. We band together. We take care of our own. 
and um, you know, we get through this and, you know, I, I know love doesn't take care of everything, but um, you know, we will be okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I keep on saying one day at a time and that's what we have to do. But luckily we sell stuff people want and need right now. And hopefully we're educating people for the future to be healthier. Thank you. Well, and amen, right? So thank you so yeah. much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And for anyone listening to this in the future, we'll make sure that we put a link or somehow let you know where you can listen to the replay or watch this video, as well as uh, the webinar that we're going to be doing. So um, I'll be certain to put a link to this, to Whole Foods Magazine on my website in the show notes, as well as um, a link to the webinar, etc. So people can go back and listen to it. Because again, it's all about educating like you started with mm -hmm. it's all about raising the bar in this industry and one thing i think that makes natural natural is that we're all in this together and it's yeah. not a you versus whatever it's how do we help each other succeed and there's that honesty and transparency that that you just don't see anywhere else that authenticity so heather thank you for your time thank you for all you do in this industry I thoroughly enjoy partnering with you or articles and, you know, look forward to working with you in the future. And, and thank you for coming on today. Same here. Thank you so much for having me. And I enjoy our partnership very much too. And look forward to the webinar next week. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. I want to thank Heather for coming on today and for sharing her insights. I also want to thank her for partnering with me on the webinar that we're talking about that's going to come out soon. You can learn more about that on the podcast webpage and through Whole Foods Magazine. In addition to that, I'll be certain to put a link to Whole Foods Magazine on the podcast webpage. This week's free downloadable guide is Trademarking Essentials to Grow and Scale Your Brand. You can learn more about how to leverage this valuable resource to build a solid foundation around your trade marketing. You can get the link to Whole Foods Magazine on the podcast webpage and in the show notes. You can also get the downloadable show guide and you can also get this week's free guide, Trademarking Essentials to Grow and Scale Your Brand on the podcast webpage. And you can get there by going to brandsecretsandstrategies.com slash session 180. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.